Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session about uh, single view 3D modeling and pose estimation. Uh, this is Jessic Park from Postec. I'm Natalia Niverova from Facebook AI Research. Yeah, uh, dear audience, we had a short announcement. Uh, please keep try to sit until the final Q and A is uh, finished for the last group of three talk in each session. Uh, in order to show respect to uh, speakers, uh, other audience who want to pay attention to all Q and A session. And let's begin the first talk. The first talk is learning single camera depth estimation using dual pixel camera by Lahul Gar, Neil Warnda, Samir Asani, and Jonathan T. Baron. And before we start, I want to remind you that we have several mics for questions in the room, and also feel free to submit your questions online using the slidl.com platform. Uh, hi, I'm Neil Wadlow from Google Research, and today I'll be talking about depth estimation. So there's a variety of ways to capture depth that are uh, varying in cost, such as predicting depth from a single RGB image, depth from stereo, or depth from active sensors. So in this talk, we'll, use dual pix we'll show how to use dual pixel images to capture depth that is low cost, but higher quality than depth from just a single RGB image. So dual pixel sensors were introduced to improve autofocus. They're becoming increasingly common on both DSLRs and mobile phone cameras. So we'll describe how they work by first going over how a camera without, dual pixel without a dual pixel sensor works. So consider a main lens and a toy sensor with five pixels, each of which has a micro lens on it to collect more light. Suppose there's an out of focus point light source on the left. Its light travels through the main lens, and because it's out of focus, it produces a blurry image. So let's look at the sensor. If we make it have dual pixels, each pixel gets split in half. If we look at the light hitting the bottom half pixels highlighted in blue, we see that it comes from the top half aperture. And the light hitting the top half pixels comes from the bottom half aperture. If we read the top and bottom half pixels separately to yield two different images, we see that there's a displacement or disparity between them because they see two slightly different viewpoints. This disparity depends on the distance of an object from the focal plane. And in previous work, we showed that one can approximate the dual pixel views as a stereo pair and compute depth using matching. However, classical stereo approaches can fail for dual pixel images. So consider this RGB image and the two corresponding dual pixel views for, to the red rectangle. This out of focus point light source changes appearance drastically between the two views. This causes problems for conventional stereo matching because these methods assume that the appearance is identical between the left and right views, which is not the case for dual pixels. As a result, the background has the wrong depth in the defocused area. This suggests a deep learning based approach that can leverage these additional cues like defocus or semantics instead of being fooled by them. However, while it might seem straightforward to collect data and train a model, it turns out there's a fundamental ambiguity that makes methods from the literature not work. To understand why, let's return to our toy example. As scene depth changes, the dual pixel images change as well, resulting in different disparities for different depths. However, if we allow other camera parameters such as focus distance or sensor distance to change, it's possible to generate identical dual pixel images for different scene depths. We can use the thin lens equation to show that this ambiguity is characterized by an affine relationship between disparity and inverse depth. Please see our paper for details. This implies it is only possible to predict inverse depth up to an unknown affine ambiguity. To handle this, we introduce affine invariant losses to train models to predict depth up to this ambiguity. These losses can also be used with view supervision. This is in contrast with monocular depth prediction, where scale invariance is typically used. For collecting training and evaluation data, we built a custom rig containing five smartphone cameras, each of which that captures a different viewpoint. We use multi-view stereo methods to compute a kind of ground truth. Let me show you some results. First, we compare scale and affine invariant losses. When we trained a UNet-like model, which we call DPNet, on dual pixel data, we see that the affine invariant prediction is higher quality than the scale invariant prediction. And this observation generalizes to other model architectures like BGG and to other monocular depth methods when trained on dual pixel data.
Now we compare to our previous work where we used classical stereo matching. Our learned approach is better both visually and quantitatively. Finally, we compare to predicting depth from just RGB. Using dual pixels is superior both to our method trained on RGB images alone and also to the state-of-the-art monocular depth estimation of Fu et al. To conclude, we showed how to learn depth estimation from dual pixels. We did this by identifying a depth ambiguity and by introducing losses that are invariant to this ambiguity. Our work is also the basis of portrait mode on the Google Pixel 3 smartphone, which recovers depth from a single camera to produce a, syn a synthetic shallow depth of field effect. Thank you. So, hello everybody. My name is Pedro Pinheiro, and this is a work done together with Negar Rostam Zadeh and Senjing An, who is currently at Rutgers University. The title of this work is Domain Adaptive Single View 3D Reconstruction. So single view 3D reconstructions aim at generating a 3D representation of an object or a scene given a single view instance of it. This is of course a very ill posed problem as many possible shapes can represent a single image. In general, deep learning approaches rely on strong priors to achieve this kind of reconstruction tasks. Uh, standard deep approaches usually follow the following recipe. First, a model is trained to reconstruct rendered images because rich 3D annotation for natural images are too difficult to acquire and annotate. Then, at test time, the model is run on natural images. Uh, there are two issues that come with this kind of approaches, though. First is that of domain shift, because natural images have very different distributions than synthetic ones. And two is that encoded 2D features might not lie on the manifold of realistic shapes, making the reconstruction more difficult. Based on these issues, we propose a framework for 3D reconstruction for natural image that exploits adversarial training in two different ways. In one hand, we impose domain confusion between natural and rendered images, and on the other hand, we exploit shape priors to constrain the encoded 2D features to lie on the manifold of realistic object shapes. We start by training a shape autoencoder to learn rich latent representations for 3D shapes, shown here as cursive E. Then, once the autoencoder is trained, we freeze those weights and proceed with the training of the reconstruction network. In our experiments, we consider both voxels and point cloud representations. Uh, the second loss is responsible to impose domain confusion between natural and rendered images. We want the features in E to be as indistinguishable as possible with respect to domain the images come from, either natural or synthetic. And to achieve this, we use a discriminator that is trained to separate the two domains while at the same time, the features F are trained to maximize the, to the, the, the domain confusion. The third loss exploited. Oh. Wait, so. <laughs> so this is the second loss. <laughs> and uh, the third loss, it exploits uh, shape priors to force reconstructions to be more realistic. Similar as before, we use adversarial training to make image encoder features and the pre-trained 3D shape encoders to be as indistinguishable as possible. This way, the, it forces the image embeddings F to lie on the same manifolds of realistic shapes, making the reconstruction easier. This is the final architecture of our model, which we call DEREC. On the top, a discriminator is trained to maximize the domain confusion between natural and rendered images. On the middle, the reconstruction network is trained from pairs of rendered images and 3D shapes. And on the bottom, there is another discriminator that leverages shape priors from a pre-trained autoencoders to force the reconstructions to look more realistic. At this time, we simply forward a natural image uh, by the image encoder F and reconstruct it with the shape decoder D. Now we show how the different losses affect the reconstruction performance. Here we measure results with chamfer distance, meaning that lower is better. The first row is the baseline, which is the simply reconstructions from synthetic images. When we are assuming only the shape prior constraint, we don't get any considerable improvements. Uh, the image domain confusion, on the other hand, already provides a big boost in performance. And finally, when considering all the losses together, the performance is improved by a large margin in both the 3D representations tested. We also compare our methods with current approaches in two popular benchmarks, which are subsets of PIX3D datasets and Pascal3D plus dataset. 
Our method performs preferably compared to other approaches, achieving state of the arts with a much simpler architecture. Moreover, many other methods use extra informations like segmentation max, the depth, or normals. And on the other hand, we use only unlabeled natural images, which are very cheap to acquire in practice. Finally, we visualize the embedding at different stages of training. In blue, we show Disney embeddings from render images, and in red, features from natural images. On the left, we see that embeddings before adaptation, and on the right, after adaptation. These plots show that after training, the features are much more domain invariant with respect to the domain that they come from, which is either natural or synthetic. And similarly, we also show uh, how the embeddings of rendered images and uh, the encoded shapes change before and after training. In general, we notice that a strong correspondence between reconstruction performance and the overlap between the different feature distributions. For further discussions and more qualitative results, please visit us at poster number two. Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Kyle Olszewski. I'm going to describe our work on transformable bottleneck networks, or TBNs, weird name I know. So a TBN is an encoder-decoder framework in which we apply spatial transformations directly to the bottleneck layer. They have a wide range of applications, including synthesizing novel views of the input image content, reconstructing its 3D shape, or performing a variety of creative manipulation tasks, which we'll show later on in the talk. So I'll discuss more about the uh, implementation and approach and results that we had obtained using TBNs. So at their core, a TBN is just an encoder and a decoder with an implicit volumetric representation of the image content as its bottleneck layer. Now this bottleneck contains a per cell feature vector describing the local shape and appearance of the image content. Now we train this to perform uh, novel view synthesis using a multi-view data set, but an important question that we have to address is how to specify the desired viewpoint transformation in this framework. Now to address this, we incorporate a new layer, which spatially resamples the encoded volume obtained from the encoder layer before passing it to the decoder. Now this resampling is done uh, by making use of the rigid viewpoint transformation between the source and target view. So the corresponding rigid viewpoint transformation defines the correspondences between the encoded feature volume from the encoder and the transformed volume that we then pass to the decoder. Now as only rigid viewpoint transformations are used during training, the encoder learns to extract and unproject visible image content from the input image, while the decoder learns to hallucinate missing content before reprojecting and synthesizing the final image. Now using this approach is actually pretty straightforward to extend this to use multiple input views when they're available to improve the overall input quality, or synthesized image quality. So to do this, we take the encoded bottlenecks from each um, available input image, transform them to align them to the uh, target viewpoint, average the per cell feature vector is to produce an aggregated, aggregated volumetric representation, which we then pass to the decoder for final image synthesis. So here you can see some examples of novel view synthesis results for a variety of objects. Now once we've extracted the encoded bottlenecks, we can synthesize arbitrary novel viewpoints simply by specifying the appropriate rigid pose transformation between the source viewpoint and the target viewpoint. And you can see this works quite well in a variety of object categories. We can also use this approach to perform volumetric reconstruction. Now to do this, we extend our approach to include a second decoder branch. Now this branch consists of an occupancy decoder and a segmentation decoder. So given the transformed volume that we pass to the image decoder for final image synthesis, the occupancy decoder takes this volume and produces a scalar occupancy volume with a value for each cell indicating whether it's empty or occupied. Now this volume is then passed to a segmentation decoder, which produces a segmentation mask corresponding to the uh, synthesized image. Now please note here that since we only use RGB images and the corresponding segmentation masks for training, 3D ground truth data is not required when using this method, which is a very powerful advantage. So here you see some examples of 3D reconstructions obtained using a single input image. You can see that we actually get pretty reasonable reconstruction results, even though 3D ground truth data is never used during training. You can also see that this produces um, pretty compelling results even in the case of challenging input poses or complex features such as concavities on the top row that are not visible in the convex hull of the image. Now using this approach we can actually perform arbitrary spatial manipulations to the input image content. Now even though we only use rigid viewpoint transformations for training for novel view synthesis, during inf uh, inference we can actually replace this rigid viewpoint transformation with an arbitrary spatial transformation which can correspond to a variety of interesting manipulation tasks. And here you see some examples of those manipulation tasks. 
um, on the left, you can see how we can vertically twist the top and bottom of the um, bottleneck to reduce this twisting effect on these swivel chairs. On the right, you can see how we can stretch along a given direction, such as the vertical axis. And on the bottom, you can see how we can, can perform nonlinear inflation and deflation. Now, please note that since we only train this using multi-view NVS data, none of these non-rigid transformations are seen during training. But once we've manipulated these bottlenecks, we can synthesize novel views by applying another rigid transformation to the manipulated bottleneck. So in conclusion, TBNs represent a very powerful and flexible approach to extract 3D information from 2D images and then perform a wide variety of flexible and creative manipulations to the image content. Uh, we encourage you to check out our project website where you'll find the code, data, and further demonstrations um, of the overall power of transformable bottleneck networks, or TBNs, as well as a paper where you go into more detail about our approach and the implementation. So thank you all for your time. So Q&A time, and we have a few online questions. Um, the question for the first paper is, what is the effect of noise in dual pixel images, for example, low light condition? And second question is, uh, the dual pixel camera could be generalized uh, any different specs? Uh, so for the noise uh, question, um, the depth estimation definitely gets worse when there's more noise. Um, there's just no getting around that. Uh, and for the second question, if I understand it correctly, um, is it possible to change the number of dual pixels or this, the location of the dual pixels? Um, this is possible, but you'd have to talk to camera sensor manufacturers. Okay. Um, we have another online question. Uh, by the way, uh, if you have a question, please to uh, please reach out to the microphone. Um, the second, uh, the question for the second paper is. How well would the network do if it only selects the applicable shape prior? For example, what would be the error if a classification network is used? And the second question for the second paper is, could you explain how to visualize the distribution of the feature representation among two domains? Uh, so for the second question, if I understand well, uh, the way we visualize, we use like a T-SNE, which is like a classic standard way that people visualize uh, features, like Latin features. And uh, I didn't really get the first question. Could you please repeat? Uh, maybe uh, only the classification prior is used for the training. Classification. What happens? Uh, so I, I haven't really tried that, so I can't really answer it. Okay. Uh, another remaining question for the third paper. Uh, what will happen, how the textures being applied, uh, were they learned as well? Uh, yes, yeah, so the textures are learned. We don't really do any sort of like explicit um, projection of uh, textures onto shapes as some other approaches do. Um, the texture data is actually just incorporated, as I mentioned, in the um, Purcell feature vectors that describe not just the shape of the overall object, but um, actually the, uh, the local appearance as well. So it'll tend to learn the kind of distribution of like uh, the textures that it sees during training. So like there'll be a variety of textures as you saw for um, the chairs, but like also for the, the cars, you'll see textures that sort of match the overall like design of the different types of cars that are seen during training. Um, I have a question for the third paper. So is that possible to manipulate uh, more knowledge of the object, for example, human, uh, like, like a manipulating posture of the human? Uh, that's an interesting question. That's something we're kind of looking into now. So like the, the um, human examples you saw, those were trained just using multiple views of people in static poses, so we didn't really use the kind of non-rigid motion from the like data set we used that included like several frames of animations. But um, that's one of, since this approach is flexible, you can pretty much define any spatial transformation. You could conceivably change the person's pose if you had a good way of um, defining the kind of like relative pose transformation in a way that you could apply in our framework. Um, that's something we're looking into now as uh, future work. Okay, uh, thank you for your answers, and let's, uh, Thank you for the speakers. The second group of speakers, please come to the chairs, and the first speaker, please come on the stage. Hi, my name is Johanna, and I'm going to talk about our work, Rio, 
which is on 3D object and sensory localization in changing indoor environments. Given the instant segmentation of a source scene, we want to relocalize objects in a target scan, taken at a later point in time. We basically want to learn correspondences. However, state-of-the-art RGBD indoor data sets are static, and no large enough data set of dynamic changes exists. So we decided to build one. We recorded RGBD indoor sequences, as you can see here on the left, and created a 3D reconstruction from it, seen here on the right. We then came back at a later point in time to scan the same space again. This was sometimes the following day, sometimes a year later. Since people live in these spaces, they naturally change. So when we look at these two scans next to each other, we see objects moving. Someone probably said here, their local context change. We call this scan here on the left, the reference scan. We densely annotate each of its object instances by painting on the 3D surface. When annotating the rescan on the right, we keep these instances persistent, as you can see with the colors. To get the 60 pose of the changed objects, we developed a scan-to-scan -scan alignment tool, where first the changed object is identified and then aligned in another view. Correspondences on the object as well as the scan are carefully selected. These serve as an input for the ground truth pose computation. This way, each changed object is annotated. In case of instance ambiguities with these two black chairs, all solutions are provided. The scanning process is then repeated to get several rescans of the same environment with different changes. Naturally, the majority of moved objects involve daily human interaction, chairs, pillows, boxes, or tables. But our data also features bigger room layout changes. We end up with 1,482 different scans of 478 unique scenes. We have more than 48,000 object instances and object alignments for 3,289 of them. Based on this data, we can now finally work on the task of object instance relocalization. With this work, we also propose a method for solving this problem. During test time, first 3D key points are extracted on the source object as well as on the target scene. Features are then uh, computed using a multi 3D multi-scale uh, network, and correspondences are computed by doing a nearest neighbor search in the latent space. We then use RANSAC to filter these correspondences. The remaining correspondences then serve as an input for a post-optimization. During training, our network takes triplets as an input, where an anchor, a 3D patch on the reference, is paired with its positive counterpart on a rescan, and a negative patch from another scene. For each sample, the TSDF volume around it is extracted at two different scales. Each scale is learned with a separate branch in our network architecture. Since it's a a triplet architecture, the distance between the positive pair is minimized and the distance between the negative is maximized. In the task of object instance relocalization, we compare against two handcrafted methods, FPFH and SHOT, as well as a learned method, 3D Match. While they still perform reasonably well, especially for more descriptive objects such as beds and sofas, our method outperforms them with a large margin especially when trained with the dynamic data that we released with this paper. In summary, in this work, we propose a new data-driven, uh, a new, new method <laughs> called object instance relocalization. We also release a large-scale data set of changing indoor environments, as well as a learned method for object instance relocalization. We believe that this data set will help to develop and to, uh, evaluate algorithms to, in the end, accomplish long-term 3D scene understanding of indoor environments. It's publicly available, so feel free to check out our project website or visit us at our poster, ID4. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Kiru Park from Tiovin. I'm going to present fixed pose, pixel-wise coordinate regression of object for 60 pose estimation. <coughs> 60 pose estimation is an essential task for robotics and AR applications. Recently, many researchers have been able to estimate accurate poses without depth values using deep neural networks. To train deep neural networks, previous work has used synthetic images for training, which requires precise 3D models with high quality textures. So, the rendered image should be similar to the one that we will obtain from the real world. However, it is difficult to build 3D models with good quality in real world because of external noises. In addition, there are two more challenges we need to face, occlusion and symmetric object. To tackle these problems, we propose pixel pose that predicts pixel-wide coordinate of object in a given image. For training the network, we need 3D models without textures and only a limited number of real images with pose annotations. To be robust to occlusion, we propose to predict not only the visible area, but also the occluded region. For symmetric object, we propose a novel loss function that guides the predictions to the closest symmetric pose. The architecture of fixed pose is the encoder and decoder structure. The outputs of the network are 3D coordinate of an object in the local frame and expected errors. To enhance the reconstruction performance, we employ adversarial training by adding a discriminator. Therefore, the training objective has three components. The first term is the adversarial training loss, and the last term is to precisely estimate the prediction errors. The second term in the middle is the reconstruction loss for the desired target. As mentioned, we consider symmetric object in this loss. I will show more details about this loss function. When we train the network from arbitrary viewpoint for symmetric object, the network suffers from ambiguous views with different pose information. The user way to solve this ambiguity is limiting the view range to predict the values from only one side of the object. However, the problem still remains at the border with completely opposite ground truth values. So, a prediction in a wrong side causes a large error with a standard error loss, which guides the network to the opposite direction. On the other hand, using the knowledge of symmetric poses, ground truth values can be transformed to those of symmetric poses by simple matrix multiplications during training. Then, the loss values are determined by taking the minimum error. As a result, the network trend with the error loss with a limited viewpoint fails to predict the poses around the border. But our proposed loss implicitly guides the network to a side by selecting the closest symmetric poses as target values. Eventually, the pose accuracy is improved with a large margin in our ovulation study. After training the network, an independent 2D detection pipeline is employed to provide 2D bounding boxes. Then we adjust these bounding boxes and remove backgrounds to derive the refined input. Then the final predictions are used to determine poses using the PMP algorithm. For the evaluation, we use three different data sets, which includes challenging features such as occlusions and symmetric industrial objects. Since we do not assume the textures, real images are used for training, and we ignore the textures in 3D models. For fully visible objects in line mode, we robustly estimated the poses without refinement and outperform state of the art using real images for training. Also, our method outperforms state of the art for occluded object and symmetric object. As a conclusion, we propose pixel pose which estimates pixel-wise coordinate values, and we show that our method is robust to occluded and symmetric object. We have few more interesting observations in our ovulation studies, so please visit our poster number five for more details, and our codes are pu publicly available online. Thank you for listening.
I'm going to present our work, Coordinates-Based Disentangled Post-Network. I'm Zigang Li from Tsinghua. Our task focuses on recover the rotation and the translation from a single RGB image, which is still challenging. It has wide applications in real world. Some people solve the problem by building the correspondences between the 2D image and the 3D model. And then both of the rotation and the translation are solved indirectly from correspondences. Differently, others want to uh, try to solve the rotation and the translation directly from image. However, rotation and the translation have different uh, properties, so the same treatment may bring different effects on them. Here for rotation, the rotation belongs to SO3, so it is difficult to regress by, uh, by your current uh, uh, networks. Uh, However, for translation, it is very, very easy to detect the 2D location and the size. So, so here we propose the disentangled strategy for rotation and the translation. The rotation is indirectly solved from correspondences, while the translation is solved directly from image. We use a detection-based framework to solve, to combine the translation and the rotation together into a single model. We propose dynamic zoom in to improve the system's robustness and the scalability to different detectors. And uh, in training, the target are from dynamic zoom in, and uh, it is from detector in test. We use coordinates-based method for rotation estimation for it shows robustness to clutter and occlusion, and we proposed must the coordinates confidence loss by only compute the coordinates loss on the foreground region. For translation, it is prob problematic to estimate the translation from the local image page. To solve this problem, we propose scale invariant translation estimation by building a model to predict the bias from the bounding box center to the object center and uh, predict an additional uh, room depth. By combining with the bounding box, the translation can be solved easily. In our entire framework, uh, we merge the backbone of the rotation part and the translation part for efficiency. We found that the rotation part is very difficult to train, so we first train the backbone with the rotation part, and then we fix the backbone and only train the translation part. Finally, we find here all of them together. Here we show the detailed architecture. We evaluate our method on the line mode and occlusion line mode data sets. When compared with the state-of-the-art RGB-based method without refinement on line mode data sets, our method without refinement surpassed them evidently on all metrics. Here are all metrics related to post-estimation accuracy. When compared with other state-of-the-art RGB method with refinement uh, by using depths or other methods, our method without post-refinement still surpasses them, evidently, on all metrics. We conduct a bleaching study on the proposed dynamic zooming mask the coordinates confidence loss, and we also evaluated the, uh, the scalability of our system to different detectors. For scale environment translation estimation, our method show great improve on all objects, and uh, more importantly, our methods are more robust to different objects. Here we compare with other state-of-the-art RGB methods on the occlusion line mode data set. We surpass them evidently. The red line show our results. Here we show some qualitative results on the line mode data set. For each object, we show the input image patch, the predicted post, and the, the predicted coordinates. And our poster is six. Please visit our poster. Thank you.
Okay, so we have a Q&A session now. If you have questions, please come to the mics. In the meantime, we have a couple of uh, questions submitted online. For the first speaker, the most popular question is, does the data set include instances in which an object only appears in the before or after scene, but not both? So if I understood correctly, if objects get removed and added to, yes. right? Yes, so it's natural changes. So there happens, ca uh, there are cases where for example, a table gets added or where a chair just disappears. Also, since the rescans are partial, potentially, sometimes you have an object move to the part of the scene where it's not being scanned anymore, so it's gone. Yeah. Okay, one more question for the first speaker. Uh, elimination seems similar between images. Does the data set include various lighting conditions, such as day and night? Um, I mean, we're in indoor scenes, so we do have very different lightning also during the day, but if it's, for example, dark outside, that makes a big difference in the reconstructed scenes and the texture of the models, as well as um, when you just close a door, the <laughs> illumination of the room is very different. So I did observe quite a lot of illumination changes. So if someone is interested in working on that, I think the data set is suitable for it. Thank you. And the last question for you is, how do you distinguish similar objects? Um, so we actually hand annotate objects that are we call instance ambiguous. So whenever there is, for example, a seminar room with similar chairs, we get the transformations between them because in a rescan, it's a pretty snapshot. We don't know how a chair moved, if they moved from, like, which one is which. So we did, did assume that both solutions are possible. So there is no way as a human to say which one is which. <laughs> Thank you. I also have a question for the second speaker. Uh, I was wondering what's the contribution of the GAN loss here? Uh, actually, it is, there is a, a relation study in the paper, so it doesn't really improve the performance for the fully visible object, but it really improves the part for uh, recovering the occluded part. So I think GAN is trying to regularize to the network to complete the whole object, even if it is occluded. Thank you. And uh, for the third speaker, I, I, if I remember correctly in your paper, that you mentioned that it, those networks are quite difficult to train. So you have a complicated training pipeline. Could you comment on that? Uh, uh. Uh, could you comment on your training pipeline? Because I remember you had to train your head separately while freezing parts of the network. So well, could you comment on that? How does that work and why was it necessary? Uh, yes, because I, I I first try to predict uh, the rotation and the translation uh, simultaneously. However, I found it doesn't work. Uh, for the rotation, it's very difficult to train, so I propose this alternative training strategy. I, uh, I think maybe uh, th uh, there should be some novel method to propose to solve the problem. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's thank the speakers again. We welcome the third group of speakers to the chairs and the first one on stage. Okay, so good morning everyone. My name is David and uh, this was a joint work with Nikila, Ben, Natalia and Andrea from the Fair London. And the goal of this work was learning the 3D geometry of non-rigid object categories, such as humans or animals, using a weak level of supervision. So to be more specific here, we wanted to use a bunch of two-dimensional object key points because these are very easy to annotate and at the same time they contain most of the information about the object geometry. So the task would look as follows. We would have a bunch of images annotated with the 2D key points and what we would like to do is to find a method which actually lifts those 2D key points into the third dimension without using a single 3D annotation. And so this is also known as a non-rigid structure from motion task. And so technically, we contribute with a novel deep network, which is called C3DPO, and that one takes a list of 2D input coordinates and then produces the parameterization of the camera together with the 3D shape in the canonical coordinates. The 3D shape is then projected back into the image, and then what we do is that we optimize the whole system such that the reprojection error is minimized. So we match the input key points to the ones which are projected back into the image. Now on this diagram, you can easily see that actually there is a trivial solution to this, which is just taking the input key points and we can just copy them to the output, right? As you can see there. 
And so this has to be fixed somehow. We do a bunch of tricks for this, but the main one is that um, we assume that the 3D shape in canonical orientation is just a linear combination of a small number of basis shapes. And so this steals the capacity from the factorization network and forces it to predict some kind of more structured solution. So what you can see also on uh, this experiment is that we have been experimenting on uh, facial key points. And if you train our network several times with different sizes of the basis, what you can see is that as you decrease the size of the basis, you are actually getting much better reconstructions. So, you know, this trick works quite well, but it was well known for ages, essentially. And um, what we propose to do is also to fix another problem, which is called the viewpoint and shape factorization. And it could be illustrated on a very simple example. So imagine that we have a shape and using our framework, we just want to rotate it, right? Now we have actually two options. Um, the first one is that we will represent the rotation as a change of the viewpoint. So we will just rotate the camera around the shape and this will just rotate the shape in the, in the 3D space. And this will also keep the static shape coefficients. However, there is also the second option, which is the core of the ambiguity, which basically says that we can keep the camera completely static, but then we can deform the coefficients or change the deformation coefficients such that the induced transformation is a rotation of the shape. And so this is a wrong thing to do, essentially, because the, this conflates the jobs of the camera matrix and the deformation coefficients, and it has to be somehow alleviated. And our main contribution here is that we propose this novel method, which is called canonicalization, which essentially resolves the ambiguity. And so this is actually quite generic method. It, its essence is the, uh, um, it's an auxiliary branch of our network, which is trained together with the factorization branch. It takes the 3D shape into canonical orientation. The first thing it does is that it rotates it randomly and then passes it through the secondary network, which is called the canonicalization network. And the goal of the canonicalization network is just to undo the random rotation. And so what this does in practice is that it um, stops the factorization network from producing two shapes which are related up to a mirror rotation. So we can see the benefits of this again on lifting facial key points. So what you can see here is that if we lift the key points without using the canonicalization branch, we actually get flat shapes. With the canonicalization, we can get much better reconstructions again. And so quantitatively, we have been able to outperform existing non-rigid structure from motion baselines. And we have also shown that the canonicalization is important in order to obtain the state-of-the-art results. These are some qualitative results on lifting human skeletons. So the top row are the input key points, the bottom row is the lifting. We have also experimented on CUB birds and uh, recall that there was not a single 3D annotation used for producing these results. And so to conclude, we have proposed one of the first deep methods for non-rigid structure of emotion. Uh, the main contribution here is the canonicalization method. Uh, we have released the source codes, so thank you very much for the attention. Next speaker. Here he is. <laughs> okay. Be careful, he's fine. Yeah. The third uh, speaker, please be prepared. Yeah, sorry, I went to the wrong session. Uh -huh. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Yi Chao Zhou from UC Berkeley. I will talk about our project, learning to construct 3D Manhattan wireframe from single image. <laughs> so 3D uh, reconstruction is one of the most important problems in computer vision. So in this problem, we take the RGB images as input and try to recover the 3D geometry. 3D reconstruction has a wider range of applications, such as AR, VR, autonomous driving, and so on. So traditional 3D reconstruction pipeline are based on the following figures. So first, the local feature extractor is running on the image pairs to build the correspondence. Next, we apply multi-build geometry to find the camera pose. And finally, we triangulate it to find the sparse point. 
However, the result point card is not very friendly for content editing, data sharing, and scene understanding. For example, in order to edit a skinned gear, the engineer needs to first convert the point cloud into a get model. For another example, with just uh, point cloud LiDAR data, it's still very hard for uh, the algorithm to pass the scene. On the other hand, we live in a man-made environment. Uh, this environment are not made up by coin cloud, but are rich of the structural regularities, including straight lines, smooth curve, and different kind of symmetries. These structures give us extra information for 3D reconstruction. With the help of deep learning, it is now possible to extract such structures. Researchers have used data-driven approaches to reconstruct depth maps, 3D bounding box, plans, uh, layouts, voxels, and meshes from single images. To find a better representation, we try to get some intuition from architects. Architects often use line drawing when design buildings, and these line drawings are called wireframes. Uh, a wireframe contains the line and the junctions. Lines are the edges of the building, while the junctions are the end point of lines. In this work, we consider two types of junctions. Uh, C junctions, marked in the red, are the corners of the building, while T junctions, marked in blue, are from the occlusion due to the projection. This slide shows the potential application of the wireframes. A user can add the logo to any building by clicking its side walls. Data are often the bottleneck of a data-driven project, so we prepare a photorealistic synthetic data set, which contains 24,000 images. The ground truth wireframe are automatically generated from the CAD models. We also manually label the wireframes for 115 real-world landmark images for model fine-tune and evaluation. This figure shows the overall pipeline of our method. From a single view image, we use the stack our glass backbone to extract features. Then we use convolution to predict the junctions and line heat maps from the backbone features. Next, we turn the vector uh, we turn them into the vector formats with a wireframe vectorization algorithm by searching on the heat maps. After that, we predict depth maps and vanishing points to get the 3D crews. Finally, we combine a 2D vectorized wireframe with 3D intermediate clues to get a full 3D wireframe. Now, let's see an example. From a single RGB image, our neural network predicts a line heat map and a two junction heat maps. We first extract C junctions from the C junction heat map and use the line heat map to construct the initial wireframe. Next, uh, we added a T-junction into this wireframe to reconstruct the whole wireframe. This wireframe is then lifted to 3D using the depth map and the vanishing points. We can use the mouse to rotate and then change the pose of camera to visual our 3D wireframe. This animation shows the result on our real world landmark data set. Here are more results on the synthetic data set. The columns shows the 2D wireframes, ground truth 3D wireframes, and the inferred 3D wireframes, respectively. In the experiment, we find that by jointly training the multiple intermediate representation of the wireframe, we can achieve the state of art performance in the wireframe extraction task, both in 2D and 3D. Uh, after this work, we further improve the 2D wireframe extraction and the vanishing point detection algorithm. Yeah, thank you for listening. My name is Shi Chen Liu. I'm from the University of Southern California. And today, I will be presenting our joint work with Tian Ye Li, Wei Kai Chen, and Hao Li. Our work on differentiable rendering is entitled Soft Rasterizer, a differentiable render for image-based 3D reading, reasoning. Image-based 3D understanding and reasoning is a fundamental and important topic in the field of computer vision which enables a variety of applications 
including 3D reconstruction, host estimation, and etc. To relate 3D properties with 2D appearance, most of the existing works seek to learn the, this relationship by supervised learning, which requires a large corpse of labeled 3D data that needs special capture devices or laborious manual work. As rendering simulates the physical process of image formation, by inverting the rendering process, we can directly infer 3D properties from 2D images without, ground, without relying on 3D ground truth. However, making rendering differentiable is not a trivial task. Progress has been made by previous works, including OpenDR and Neural Mesh Renderer. However, they approximate the gradient using handcraft functions while directly using traditional rendering pipeline as forward function. Such ad hoc ad formulation may fail on some, some cases due to the inconsistency between the forward and backward functions. In our work, we instead focus on a truly differentiable rendering pipeline that can directly render color mesh with differentiable functions. We showed that this consistent formulation of differentiable rendering performs better in many application scenarios. Let's start with traditional rendering pipeline. As we show in the figure using red boxes, there are two non-differentiable functions, rasterization and z-buffering. Our basic idea is to replace these non-differentiable functions with differentiable functions. Rasterization can be viewed as binary masking that is determined by the relative position between pixels and triangles. We model this binary masking with continuous probability map so that the render pixel can be related to the mesh vertices in a differentiable way. Z-buffer emerges the results of rasterization in a one-hot manner. We further model it as an aggregate function based on softmax. By adjusting two hyperparameters, we can achieve, ver achieve various rendering effects, including that of a standard graphics renderer. With this plug-and-play module, we can enable a variety of applications. By adding software as a differentiable layer between vertices and the images, we can backpropagate supervision signal to neural network for single view 3D reconstruction, single, simply using 2D images. As seen on the right side, the network manages to reconstruct shapes with fine details with solely 2D image supervision. Thanks to our truly different formulation, our reconstruction accuracy has outperformed pre previous state-of-the-art by a large margin. To better demonstrate the effectiveness of image-based gradient provided by SoftRes, we, so we show the deformation results of deforming a template mesh to a car and then to a plane using images from multi-view. Lastly, we show the application of reasoning 3D poses of both, both rigid and non-rigid objects. As seen on the left side, since we can achieve rendering with various blurriness, we can smooth the energy landscape to escape from local minima. In addition, since software can propagate gradients to occluded vertices, we can handle challenging pose estimation for non-rigid objects, as shown on the right side where the right hand of the subject is completely occluded. We have released our code on GitHub, which is implemented in PyTorch. You can scan the QR code to ac access the repo online if you want to try our code. Uh, our poster is in number nine in session 4.1. Please come to our poster if you want to see more results and know more about our implementations. Thank you. A type of question. Uh, we have a few online questions. Uh, for the first speaker, um, uh, can the network can be used for six degree of freedom estimation? Yes, actually the network uh, does six degrees of freedom estimation in some cases. For instance, if you have perspective projection model, then the translation of the camera has to be uh, modeled. Otherwise, you know, the, the projection doesn't make sense. So there, are, there is a bunch of experiments where actually we, we model the, the three additional degrees of freedom. Uh, another question for the first speaker is, is there any prior knowledge used for, um, for example, human reconstruction? 
There is, uh, there is no prior on any of the uh, 3D information which we are in actually inferring. The, the only information we are using is just a bunch of the 2D key points. Okay. Um, for the second speaker, um, have you tried to use um, uh, texture meshing to make uh, some Nobel view synthesis? Make sorry. So given the reconstructed lines, maybe we can build uh, meshes to build uh, some Nobel view synthesis? Uh, yeah, so that's one of our future work is to combine the wireframe with applying the information. Mm -hmm. And another question, online question is, would, will it be inefficient to enumerating all junction pairs? Uh, yes, so in, uh, in one of our, my other works so about the 2D wireframe instruction, uh, we do that and it's really improved performance of the 2D wireframe instruction algorithm. I see. Uh, the last question is, does the proposed method can handle some curved structure? Uh, what, what structure? Curved structure. Uh, no, so one of the biggest challenges for this kind of method is that we need a, a annotated data set which contains the uh, curve. So uh, yeah, so this is also one of our future work. Okay, uh, for the third speaker, um, the question is from online is can your lender deal with textures? Sorry, lender? Uh, can your lender can deal with texture? So it seems like a per triangle lending. Yeah. So how, they, how it can be used for texture lending as well? Texture render. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can use texture map for sure. Because in, in, our, uh, in our color uh, formulation, we actually do the same as the in traditional uh, rendering pipeline that we choose to pick a uh, color from texture map and uh, use it at the as uh, C in the formulation in the paper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question is, um, compared to some conventional rendering pipeline, uh, it is quite uh, brand new, and maybe it will add some add additional computational complexity. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, it, it will, it will uh, theoretically, it will introduce like a, a quite a lot of computation and complexity. But actually, uh, in in the implement implementation, uh, when we compute like uh, the uh, dis uh, distance map in our paper, uh, we can actually ca truncate those uh, too small to that can contribute uh, to the final results. So in this way, we can reduce a lot of uh, computation. Actually, we train quite fast. Uh, we, it only needs like uh, one day to get it coverage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the answers. And okay. let's thank speakers. My name is Kerem Iskakov, and today I'll present our new paper, Learnable Triangulation of Human Pose. In this work, we tackle the problem of 3D human pose estimation from multiple cameras. We present two novel methods based on learnable triangulation, which strongly outperforms previous state of the art. Note how smooth and accurate the predicted poses are without any temporal processing. Formally, the problem can be stated like this. Have an images from multiple cameras and set up parameters as input, return 3D key points of the human skeleton. A baseline approach works as follows. The extracted 2D skeleton key points are passed to some triangulation algorithm to obtain output 3D skeleton. Such approach is easy to use, but it has many weaknesses. First, it's very sensitive to outliers in 2D key points. Second, the input to the triangulation algorithm is a 2D skeleton, which is a handcrafted representation. Also, there is no easy way to model a human pose prior and a naively implemented pipeline is not fully differentiable, which leads to disagreement between different parts. These problems were addressed by other researchers. Despite this, the resulting accuracy is only marginally higher compared to modern monocular methods. So the baseline approach is still a workhorse method in many practical situations. In this work, uh, we present two new methods for pose triangulation. Here is our first method based on algebraic triangulation. 
It is similar to the baseline approach but differs in two critical aspects. First, it's fully differentiable. To solve this, we use soft argmax aggregation and triangulate key points via differentiable SVD. Second, the neural network uh, additionally predicts color confidences past the triangulation module, which successfully deals with outliers and occluded joints. For the most popular human 3.6M dataset, this method already dramatically reduces error by 2.2 times compared to the previous art. With this model, we solve two problems of the baseline approach, but there are still two problems left, namely handcrafted features and the absence of human pose prior. We have developed our second method, volumetric triangulation, to solve these issues. The key operation of our second method is on projection. Suppose we have a volumetric cube and for simplicity, for simplicity two cameras. Each camera produces some 2D feature map. These 2D feature maps shine into the volume and fill voxels along corresponding camera rays. In volumetric triangulation model, intermediate 2D feature maps are densely unprojected to the volumetric cube and then processed with 3D convolutional neural network. Unprojection allows dense aggregation from multiple views and the 3D convolutional neural network is able to model implicit human pose prior, thus solving the two remaining weaknesses of the baseline approach. Volumetric triangulation additionally improves accuracy, drastically reducing the previous state-of-the-art error by 2.4 times. Even compared to the best parallel developed method by MSRA group, our method still offers significantly lower error. This model can take an arbitrary number of images as input, thus allowing bootstrapping. The method works even for a single image, demonstrating accuracy close to the best monocular methods. We have also conducted experiments on CMU panoptic dataset, where the advantages of the volumetric approach are dramatic. Using four cameras, we managed to get a 14 millimeters error in absolute world coordinates. Note, even though all frames are processed independently, predicted poses are very smooth and accurate. To demonstrate the transferability of our approach, we evaluated a CMU panoptic trained model on the human 3.6M dataset without any fine tuning. Our method generalizes well to completely new setups and lighting conditions. Thank you for your attention. Please check out our GitHub repository for the PyTorch code and pre trained models. Looking forward to see you at our poster number 10 for more details and visualizations. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dennis, and this is our work on egocentric 3D human pose estimation. Our goal is giving a single image taken from a camera mounted on a headset looking down to infer the person's 3D pose as a set of 3D joint locations. Solving this task opens up several applications ranging from AR and VR, where people need to interact with the environment, to imitation learning from humans to robots. Egocentric pose estimation is significantly harder than the more common case of a front-facing camera. The additional challenges are severe self-occlusions due to the camera being located so close to the face, particularly notice how often the lower body and hands are occluded, and extreme perspective distortion caused by the use of fisheye lenses. These result in large differences in pixel densities. Notice how there are fewer pixels to regress the pose of the feet. These conditions are so unique that no existing dataset satisfies them. In the last two years, some steps have been taken toward real-world prototypes for egocentric motion capture. Previous work includes EgoCap's cumbersome helmet-mounted dual camera system and Mo2Cap2, a more practical monocular configuration attached to a baseball head. In contrast, our configuration is the first product-oriented solution with a single grayscale camera completely integrated on the headset. 
With the fisheye camera just two centimeters away from the face, our approach must cope with more severe self-occlusions and extreme distortions. The contributions of our work are twofold. The introduction of a new photorealistic synthetic dataset and the novel neural network architecture. We present XR EgoPose, a new egocentric dataset with around 400,000 images. The dataset features 46 characters, 23 males and 23 females. It has been designed to maximize variability with actors of different skin tones performing various actions under different lighting conditions and environments. All images contain per pixel ground truth information, depth, um, surface normals and semantic segmentation. Our focus is to provide an open and diverse large-scale training corpus to facilitate generalization to unseen real-world footage. These side-by-side -side views highlight the increased photorealism, resolution, and quality of our dataset compared to MotuCap2, the only other currently available egocentric dataset with a fewer number of frames. Our second contribution is in a novel dual-branch uh, autoencoder architecture. In this architecture, the first module regresses heat maps that encode 2D joint locations and their associated uncertainty with a supervised loss on ground truth 2D annotations. Heat maps are then encoded in a low dimensional embedding. The decoder has two branches. The first decodes uh, the 3D poses from the latent space, while the second reconstructs the input heat maps. This is to force the latent vector to encode the uncertainty of the 2D joints. Our ablation study shows that adding the second branch to encode uncertainty in the latent space provides a massive 55% improvement with respect to the single branch version. Our architecture also allows semi-supervised training. For example, if an image only has 2D labels but no 3D ground truth, only the heat maps will contribute to the loss. Furthermore, our experiments also prove that 3D errors always decrease when additional 2D datasets are used while training. This video shows the reconstructed 3D pose uh, on our synthetic dataset in an indoor scene. We also show that our model generalizes well to real-world images recorded using a physical headset. It's important to notice that in this case the model was trained on our XR EgoPose dataset and later fine-tuned on images from the real dataset for a few iterations. We have compared our method against MotuCap2 approach uh, providing also a qualitative evaluation where both models were trained using their own training dataset. Note how our approach achieves a remarkable 21% improvement on indoor test set and more than 25% improvement on their outdoor test set. Finally, here are some results on Human 3.6M showing great performance on the 3D human pose estimation from external cameras. Please come to see us at Poster 11. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zhou Yongzhen from Tsinghua University. Today I'm going to talk about our work on deep human, 3D human reconstruction from a single image. Given a single image, 3D reconstruction of closed humans can enable many applications, including image editing, virtual trial-on, propagation, and so on. However, reconstructing a 3D human model from a single image is very challenging due to the varieties of body shapes, poses, and growth styles. To address these challenges, the authors of BodyNet designed a multi-stage network for volumetric body reconstruction. However, their method fails to generate satisfactory results due to the difficulties of regressing 3D, 3D models from 3D jo joint predictions. C-Crop reconstructs 3D models from multi-view silhouettes. Although the textual output is impressive, their method cannot reconstruct surface details from sparse views of silhouettes and may suffer from inconsistency across views. In HMD, the authors deform a human body template according to the silhouette and shading information. Although achieving promising results, their method is inherently unable to reconstruct loose curls as skirts and dresses. In this work, our goal is to design a robust method to reconstruct 3D human models with geometry details given only a single image. To achieve this goal, our key insight is that no matter what kind of outfit the subject wears, 
A body temporary estimation can provide studies shape and post reference of the subject and resolve depth ambiguities. Therefore, the network doesn't need to infer the body shape and post anymore and can focus on learning to reconstruct the clothing layers. Note that the reliance on simple model estimation is not a serious issue because the last few years have witnessed a huge progress in this topic. However, combining the information from the image and the simple model is not as straightforward because they are in different domains and have different data structures. Of course, we can design two encoders to encode the image and the simple model separately and then decode the concatenation of the lesson code. But this method ignores the spatial relationship between the input image and the simple model and hence results into lots of geometry details. In this work, we adopt a spatially analyzed method. Firstly, we virtualize the simple model to, con to construct an input volume. We add semantic encoding to occupy vessels to provide more semantic information. By performing 2D and 3D convolutions, we can obtain 2D, a 2D feature map and a 3D feature volume. We propose to perform feature fusion using volumetric feature trans transformation, or VFT. Specifically, a VFT layer first learns to extract the affine transformation parameter pair from the 2D feature map, and then apply pixel-wise affine transformation on the sizes of the feature volume. In other words, for each vessel, the feature transformation is conditioned on the pixel-aligned image features that is aligned with its 2D projection. Note that our proposed volumetric feature transformation is both efficient and effective and can be easily extended to multiple scales. By decoding the de transformed feature volume, we can obtain our rec reconstruction results in the form of occupancy volume. To recover more surface details, we propose directly project normal, normal maps from the occupancy volume and refine them using UNET. Our network is trained in an end-to-end -end manner with a combination of different losses. Please refer to our paper for more details about input pre-processing, network design, and loss simulation. Our network needs, needs a large-scale data set of realistic 3 d models for training. Since there is no proper data set available, we utilize the state-of-the-art RGB difference system and collect T-human, a large-scale data set containing about 7,000 realistic 3 d models of various body shapes, poses, and clothes styles. Benefited from our network architecture and diverse training data, our method can achieve accurate and consistent reconstruction of challenging human bodies and outfits. Compared to body net, our method is robust to challenging human bodies. Compared to C crop, our me method offers more plausible and detailed reconstruction results. Compared to HMD, our method can handle more cross topologies. <laughs> our code and data will be available online. For more details and discussion, please come to our poster. Thank you for your attention. We we'll have quite a few questions in a poll. First, uh, for the first speaker, uh, how does your method handle how does your method handle occlusions? Ah, yes. Actually, we presented two methods. The first method about algebraic triangulation um, to handle occlusions and outliers in 2D key points. We additionally predict 2D, con uh, we predict color confidences and uh, then triangulate uh, our 2D key points to the 3D skeleton using these confidences. In the second method, all the occlusions are. Um, all the occlusions are dealt with a 3D convolutional neural network, so uh, it's done by training. Okay, and uh, another question is how do you choose camera viewpoints and whether or not they are fixed during training? Um, we use two data sets, Human 3.6M and uh, CMU Panoptic. The camera viewpoints are fixed, so we use just training data from the data sets. And what's the inference speed on single GPU? Um, yeah, we get about one FPS for the, our best models, but um, our first experiment showed that we can manage, we can get about 15 FPS on one uh, 280 uh, Ti, NVIDIA, and GPU, yes. Thank you. Uh, question for the second speaker. 
what are the applications of egocentric pose estimation? Um, so, I mean, in, in AR and VR, there is a clear application because whenever you want to have like interaction between people or the gaming where you have to understand the kind of poses the person is doing, like there is a clear application or in robotics for like uh, allowing robots to understand tasks by learning on how humans move. So these are, are probably the two more s typical applications, that, but like it's not limited to this. It could be also like in robotics, how to control robots using your hand while wearing a headset. So it becomes like a third controller. Okay, and in your data set, do you only have people standing? Uh, no, so we, we have like uh, a bunch of different actions. So I if you're gonna come to the poster, you will see uh, a list of a sub list of the actions and so we have like people doing stretching all kind of different motions including like bending and sitting and uh, challenging playing uh, actions thank you and question for the third speaker uh, do you think that adding an adversarial loss would be helpful yeah it would be helpful but uh, due to the memory consumption we didn't do this experiment Okay, and also there was another question on the robustness of your method uh, with respect to perturbations in the input. Sorry? Robustness of your input with respect to non-differentiable image perturbations. Uh, I, I would assume just, um, for example, affine transforms in, in the input space. I think, uh, uh, so actually the, the botnet, the, uh, our method relies on the simple model estimation. So if uh, the, the we can use the state of the art simple model estimation method for the uh, the for the uh, estimation. So, if 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 the, if the method we use is robust to the official estimation, it will be okay. Thank you. Let's thank the speakers again. Hi everyone. Uh, my title is a neural network for detailed human depth estimation from a single image. Uh, human body modeling is a hot spot in computer vision from high level to low level. Human body can be represented by skeleton, segmentation, the model, 3D mesh, point crowd, and volume. And based on different representations, many human modeling work have been composed. And recently, some work are focusing on estimating human shape from a single RGB image by different methods, like BodyNet HMR. However, only few frameworks have the mechanisms specifically dealing with surface details like close wrinkles. So here is our motivation. Let's take a look at this picture. By given a single RGB image, we want to estimate the depth of the human body. And if we want to faithfully recover the 3D information only from this image, we need to handle different poses and body types, and also, Geometric details like close wrinkles. To this end, we proposed a normal framework, and here's our pipeline. Our network consists of three components segmentation, skeleton net, depth estimator, and depth refinement module. In the first module, we take the input RGB and use two hourglass networks to estimate the body part segmentation and 3D skeleton separately. And we use this output as prior to guide the depth estimation task later. From the ablation study, we can see that without high level information to guide the depth estimation, the result may have large structure errors, such as collapsed regions. After we get the 3D joint and segmentations, we concatenate them with our original RGB image and pass them to the uh, autoencoder. After the decoder, we split the output into two branches. They are used to estimate the rough shape and the surface detail of a human body. The training phase can be also divided into two stages. First, we train these two branches independently. And at stage two, we add these two outputs to get the final result and join to train these branches um, by the composed loss from these three shapes. We also did ablation study to show the importance of this two branch architecture and the two stage training strategy. For more technical details,
please refer to our paper. After we have the initial depth estimation, we further refine it by our third module. Here, we firstly use our hourglass network to predict the surface normal of human body and create a parameter free layer to intuitively refine the depth map. And the main idea is that the tangent vector on the surface should be perpendicular to the normal, and the current estimated depth shouldn't be too far away from the in initial depth estimation. We apply this pr uh, pr uh, process five times to get the final result. In our work, we use UP3D, Serial, and our own capture data RGBD dataset to train our network. UP3D and Serial dataset are used to train the skeleton and joint networks, and we use Serial to train the basic shape branch since Serial is synthetic data which doesn't contain any geometric details. And our own captured RGBD dataset is still used to train the normal network and detail shape branch network. We will re release the data soon for the future research. And, from, and to show the generalizability of our work, we replace the skeleton and the segmentation module by other of the shape networks. The network still works reasonably well, and we can see our method can recover more details than other methods, and our method doesn't suffer from the error caused by discretization. Here are more results. The middle columns are the normal map predicted by our ne normal net. And from the, uh, from the table, we can see that our method also achieved the lowest error. And from the CDF curve, shows on the right, we can see the curve of our method is also on the top of others. And Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here to present our work, DensePose, which for the task of joint 3D posts and shape estimation from monocular images. So this is a joint work by Facebook Reality Labs and UCLA. So um, our motivations, motivation is existing frameworks. We are doing this direct regression. So which uh, given little information regarding to the body shapes. But in our framework, actually, we consider this intermediate representation, the IUV maps, maps which provide like richer uh, body geometry information and also has less instances, like textures and lights, so which is easier for the neural network to learn the 3D human body. So um, the proposed framework, uh, first, it has a two-step framework, which has two steps. In the first sub-step, we uh, first estimate the uh, IUV, IUV, uh, IUV images from the RGB inputs. Um, so, so far we use the pre-trained dense post model for this part. And for the second part, we learn a model that given a IUV image as inputs, we regress to the parametric body models, and then we do a scanning to get the, reconstruct the reconstructed 3D human body. So we notice that not all the training data set has uh, paired ground truth, fully paired ground truth. So what we do here is that we incorporate a differentiable rend renderer, which then we could uh, project the reconstructed 3D human body into multiple subspaces, see the rasterized IUV images, and also a dense reprojected landmarks, and also part masks, part masks, so that we could compare with the input to minimize the differences between the input and the rendered outputs. So another problem, another technique we use to tackle the problems of unpaired uh, training data is that we incorporate uh, the synthetic data into our training network, into our training framework. So what we do is that we collect um, mocap and other skeleton sequences, and also we collect the body shapes from 3D scans, and then we render them to generate large synthetic data with 40 paired ground truth, so that we could use those uh, ground truths to help us to learn the model matter. So 
for the synthetic data set, we propose this large scale um, synthetic data set. We call it MOCA. So which contains two parts. The first of all, for those skeleton sequences, which we collect from both mocap sequences and also for some 3D animations, which contains a lot of like uh, long tail poses and actions. And for the body shapes, we have it from the 3D scans and then we render them under randomized camera views, which gives us the uh, 40 period ground truth for the model training. So um, we compared our framework with other competitive methods and multiple tasks. The first one is 3D pose estimation. So the second one is uh, semantic segmentation. And also the last one is we compared the 3D body reconstruction of our own synthetic data set. So you can see that we achieved state-of-the-art performance compared with other competitive methods. So here are some qualitative results. As you can see that compared with other competitive methods, actually taking those realistic images from Coco as inputs, we can reconstruct more accurate poses. And also, we can also re reconstruct finer body shapes and the details. And also, it is more robust against the nuisance, like textures, lights, shading, occlusions, and crowded people. So here is a, some more qualitative resource and videos. Notice that for all the methods, we only do the, the 3D body estimations per frame. We do not add any temporal or post-processing on the resource. And as you can see that, actually, our resource is more stable uh, compared with other methods. And also another thing I want to mention is that for other methods, because they always use cropped uh, person image, center, uh, cropped and scaled image as inputs. So you have to like run an additional 2D post estimators to uh, crop and scale the input images. But for us, because we use dense pose, which originally uh, include the detection framework, so we can directly use dense pose as inputs and just run our framework. So we do not need additional modules for multiple people 3D post estimations, sorry, 3, 3D body estimations. So another uh, qualitative resource we want to show here is we want to show that we are actually doing a good job on body shape estimations. So compared with other frameworks, which actually have little supervisions regarding to the body shapes, the proposed frameworks actually generates a very a closer body shapes regarding to the input image. And for the rest of the methods, you can see that most of those methods seems to generate the mean body shape regardless of the uh, actual body shapes. So if you have any questions, do find us at the poster 14. I didn't mention a lot of technical details in this oral presentation. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jue. Today I'm presenting not all parts are created equal 3D human pose estimation by modeling bidirectional dependencies of body parts. The physiological structure of a human body results in that different body parts may have different degrees of freedom. Conventional methods treat all the parts equally, which often leads to much larger errors on higher DOF joints. For example, the method of Martinez and others produces more accurate predictions for joints on the torso, but poorer ones for distal limb joints. To this end, we propose two solutions. The first one is the bidirectional dependency model. We model the high DOF joints as dependent components of the lower DOF ones, and in turn, enforce the former to impose physical constraints on the latter. We also introduce pose attributes to help 3D pose estimation. The motivation is that generally a 2D pose does not contain enough information to infer the 3D pose and often lead to wrong results. The pose attributes encoding additional image cues are aimed to rectify the 3D pose in, the, in these cases. Our method consists of two steps. In the first step, the 2D pose and the pose attribute are estimated from the input image using a multitask network. In the second step, both of them are fed into the bidirectional dependency model to estimate the 3D pose progressively. The, the multitask network is trained on the mixture of MP2 and human 3.6 million data set. As discussed, it handles both 2D pose estimation and post-attribute learning. As there are no 3D annotations available in MP2, 
we adopt an unsupervised domain adaptation method to help the network to learn to predict post attributes in the absence of attribute supervision. The estimated 2D posts and post attributes are then fed into the 3D post estimation network, which explicitly models the bidirectional dependencies via a two-block network architecture. In the first block, we allow the location of the higher DOF groups to be the dependent variables of those of the lower DOF joints. In the second block, the higher DOF groups from the first block in turn constrain the locations of the lower DOF ones. We evaluate our method quantitatively on two most popular human post benchmarks. Our method achieves the best results on both human 3.6 million and 3D HP dataset. In this histogram, we saw the estimation errors of different joints. To better understand how our method improves the performance, we calculate the performance gain on each joint. We can see that our method achieves the best results across all the joints, and as expected, the performance gain on higher tier of joint joints tend to be larger. <coughs> In this video, we show several qualitative results of various activities from human 3.6 million data set. The 3D post results are, esti are estimated frame by frame, and no smoothing techniques have been used. The color of a load denotes the level of prediction error, while the color of an edge denotes the left or right side of the body. Of the, as we may observe, our predictions are visually very close to the ground truth. We also show several quantitative, quantitative results on MP2, a 2D post dataset that has no 3D annotations. We only use this dataset to train the multitask network. The result shows that our method, our method works well on images with various backgrounds and activities. To test the cross-domain generalization ability, we test our method on another unseen data set from which no data have been used for training. Our method also works well on this data set, demonstrating the robustness of the, our method on domain shift. In this video, we show the 3D post estimation results conditioned on different post attribute settings. In most cases, changing the attribute on a joint will lead to a change of the 3D pre prediction, indicating that the post attributes are effective and the imp interpretable price for 3D post estimation. <coughs> Thank you, and welcome to poster 15 for more details. Thank you, question. Uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, please try to remain seated uh, to respect our uh, uh, to give our respect to the speakers. Uh, we got some question on the online. The question for the first speaker is, what is the difference between base model and detail model? Um, the detail and mo uh, base shape are um, country as the uh, rough shape and uh, um, the high frequency detail of the human body, just like close wrinkles, those bumps. Uh, so actually, we apply blatter filter on the RG, uh, RGB image, and we treat the uh, high high frequency content as the uh, as the detail shape, and the low frequency content as the base shape. So uh, we want to train these two branches separately. Uh, another question is uh, when the normal map and the composite shape is being iteratively refined. It seems like energy minimization. So is that fully differentiable? Yeah, uh, it's fully differentiable. We create a differentiable layer to do that. It's um, it's a parameter-free layer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the question for the second speaker um, is: Does the method can handle all the number of limbs because of the, some occlusion of the multiple people? Um, yes. At the moment, actually, for occlusions, you will also still have some problems because you didn't have any observations regarding to those, those occluded body parts. So maybe they are just using some like pot you just reconstruct some post priors learned from the data. And the method is depends on the dense post. So the yeah. question is about how low was to uh, some erroneous estimation of the from dense post. Oh, sorry? Uh, how's, how's the low to dense post input? Uh, what do you mean by levels? Um, so the performance. 
Oh, yeah. yeah actually, yeah, because Tensepos actually can handle a large variety of uh, the poses, but it still has some problems how to handle those like uh, very difficult poses, uh, like athletes or whatever those poses. But I think it generally performs one for those realistic data. So we still can look for more improvements by including the uh, dense post model training into the whole pipeline. So at the moment, we, still, we only use the pre-trained dense post model at the, at the moment. Thank you. The last question for the third speaker is um, the ovulation studies on which loss is the most important to affect the uh, performance or accuracy? Uh, the 3D post loss, of course. Uh -huh. So can you a uh, little bit comment on that, why that is important? Uh, actually, uh, as, as we talked to the ablation study, we need to discuss which part of component is more important. Uh, in our experiment, the post attribute contributes the most uh, uh, performance gain because it, in some, it can solve the 2D to 3D regression ambiguous to some extent. And the last question is how this approach can be compared with the uh, 3D full shape reconstruction approaches? Uh, actually, we do not do the shape uh, reconstruction, so we cannot talk too much about this question. OK, so we are out of the time. And let's thank uh, speakers again. And thank you for being this session. Uh, this is the end of the session. And enjoy the last of the conference today. Thank you.